but I'm Joshua Schumer from the Piper Jaffray Biotech team. Pleasure to introduce on behalf of Bluebird Bio, uh, Jeff Walsh, Chief uh, Operating Officer, who I think has a few slides prepared for us, and then we'll head into Q&A. Great. Well, I want to just thank uh, Arm in particular um, for pulling this together. It's wonderful, and also uh, for our sponsors as well. So I just have three or four prepared slides, maybe five, and then we're going to get into a Q&A. Uh, many of you may know Bluebird. Um, we are uh, developing therapies for severe genetic and rare diseases in the gene therapy space. Uh, I'm going to be making forward-looking statements. We are a risky company, and please consult uh, SEC documents for uh, further risks and, and the like. Um, one of the things that we pride ourselves on and have from the beginning of Bluebird is having a very, very strong connection uh, to the patient communities that we so desperately seek to serve. And up here you see a few of them from the ALD community, uh, CLD, CALD community. If you've spoken ever with a parent or uh, a family member, somebody who has CALD, you really appreciate the fact that these are devastating diseases that have such a dramatic effect uh, on the patient themselves, but also the patient's families. And then also in beta thalassemia, especially the, the severe form, the transfusion-dependent form, as well as uh, severe sickle cell disease, you talk to the patients and their families and you really get a deep appreciation for um, uh, the impact on, on, again, not just their lives, but the entire uh, lives that, uh, of their families as well. And then we are moving. It was nice to hear Oz put us in the, the CAR-T world uh, as a competitor, which we believe we are. Um, maybe haven't gotten the recognition, partly because we hadn't had a product in the clinic until recently. But you see a patient with multiple myeloma up here as well, and we're very, very um, anxious to get that data uh, from the clinic as well in our CAR-T program, the first of an emerging pipeline of, of products. Um, so we all know the emerging field of gene therapy and CAR-T cells and gene editing. We've been talking about it all day today. But interestingly, if you took this slide four years ago, I think we all have an appreciation for it. There might have been four companies up here. It's been such a dramatic uh, explosion of, in, of investment and, uh, and funding of, of technologies and products. And one of the things that I'd like to point out that is probably obvious to those that know, Blue, know Bluebird is that we have investments in each of these. So we're a pretty diversified company, and we've been the early players in certainly a gene therapy, definitely in the CAR T cell world, and then our acquisition of uh, Progenin a couple of years ago in the gene editing field. So we think we have a lot of tools to bring to bear on the manufacturing side as well as the, the product portfolio side. And to that end, we have two basic platforms. Um, that lead our strategic uh, direction of the company. One is focused on hematopoietic stem cells, and this is really severe genetic diseases, and the second is focused on T cells, and this is the immunotherapy uh, field that was certainly just discussed in the last panel. But underlying that is four or five years of very, very significant investment in the manufacturing. And it's not just about getting that GMP product out. It's now about purity, it's about potency, it's about reproducibility, and it's about scalability. Um, a lot of the conversations today have been about that. I think that's where we're somewhat differentiated in our investment in this um, going back four plus years. And then clearly we have other technology platforms like our Megatel platform that we've invested in. This has led to a, a fairly robust and diversified pipeline from our cerebral ALD product, which is uh, in phase two, three, our lentiglobin product, which is in two indications, across uh, transfusion-dependent thalassemia and severe sickle cell disease, one later than the other, and then our uh, growing immuno-oncology pipeline anchored by our first clinical program in multiple myeloma, and then an early pipeline uh, leveraging our gene editing technology and some of the other uh, platform technologies. And then this is the last slide, which is really laying out for 2016. With all of that, with all that history, with all of the, the pipeline that's building, what are we focused on in 16? And for beta thalassemia, it really is about regulatory filing and trying to understand the path to a regulatory filing, but really getting ready for a launch of that product in the ensuing years. We heard about the need to make investments very early in this space, absolutely true of, of what we're doing in the ex vivo world. 
Um, so launch prep is, is a big part of 2016 priorities for beta thalassemia, as we think we have a product there. For sickle cell disease, it's really about understanding the data, learning, learning, learning through the clinical experience and developing a uh, clinical strategy going forward uh, based on those learnings. For CALD, many of you know that we are presenting our first data for that phase two, three program at AAN in April. And uh, the intent there is to, to get more clarity based on that data and ensuing data from that trial on the regulatory strategy going forward for multiple myeloma, obviously early in the clinic, so we need to get our development strategy nailed based on the data that emerge and then continue to evolve the pipeline with new products. So a real quick hit and run on the company and, and our pipeline, and I think we're gonna get into some questions um, now going forward. Okay, well, I mean, too much to cover in 15 minutes, but, but I guess we'll do, we'll do our best. So, so next up is the CALD data at AN. Maybe you could just set the stage for us. I guess this is a pseudo-inflammatory condition of the brain characterized by very long chain fatty acids somehow accumulating and causing the inflammation. Uh, tell us a little bit about the LENT-ED approach and what we should be looking for in the data to know that the, the product is, is doing what it's supposed to do. Great, thanks, Josh. Um, so uh, the reason that there's this very long chain uh, fatty acid buildup in the brain is that there's a genetic mutation in the ABCD1 gene that unfortunately prevents these young boys from clearing those uh, very long chain fatty acids, and that causes basically an attack on the nerves of the brain, uh, resulting in demyelination. And then uh, unfortunately, when they present with symptoms, a very, very rapid decline over several years toward vegetative state and death. So it's a, it's a horrible, horrible diagnosis for uh, a parent and, and certainly for that, that boy to, to go through. It's X-linked, so it affects young boys. Um, it's a disease we haven't talked a lot about. Really, we've been silent for several years as we've uh, gone through this phase two, three program and started to enroll patients and then started to get data. Um, there are a number of, um, of endpoints that we're looking at in this trial. Uh, ultimately, we're looking for something called MFDs, uh, major functional disabilities, which is uh, during a two-year course after a single therapeutic intervention, do the boys develop these major functional disabilities, cannot speak, cannot ambulate, uh, cannot feed themselves. This is unfortunately the trajectory of these boys if they're, they're untreated. And so that's the ultimate outcome. What we disclosed in the abstract just recently was that uh, we had uh, 17 um, boys at the time of, of the abstract submission um, in the trial that had a certain amount of, of follow-up. Um, only a small number of them had greater than six months. Uh, but ultimately, we're looking for some early signals, quite frankly, of are we having an effect on, on the disease. Uh, some of them are, are they developing any functional disabilities? There's this, this uh, score called NFS, which the clinicians use to determine whether the boys are progressing. And are they progressing at all? So that's one indication. With ALO, which is a standard of care, you do see some progression during the early parts, the first six to 12 months, as the therapy starts to take hold. We expect that actually with our therapy as well. But one of the early indicators is inflammation. Uh, all of these boys present with inflammation, um, and uh, it's called gadolinium positive, uh, and they all have to have be gadolinium positive to come into the trial. If you see early resolution of that inflammation, i.e. goes from positive to gadolinium negative, then you have a, an early belief that you're having an effect. You're dampening the inflammation, you're potentially having uh, an early effect on the disease. So that's the first indication. And then it progresses from there, from NFS and then another um, look at the, at the disease from an imaging standpoint called the LESS score, which we can't, don't have time to get into, but it's an indication of how uh, the lesions are progressing. Are they getting worse or not? We could probably spend an hour on the topic because um, we actually did with the specialist last It's I mean, it's a fascinating indication and, and a lot of hope that the, the LENTD product will, will deliver the equivalent efficacy as an allo minus the, the morbidity and mortality. But, but it, with a limited amount of time, maybe we can shift to um, lentiglobin. It was a little bit of a rocky year, at least from investor sentiment and understanding of, uh, of the product and its utility in, in sickle. I thought you guys did a great job at, at ASH you know, preparing us for the next stage of, of what's to come. Um, maybe take us through what you've learned about about lentiglobin and its its utility in, in the various beta-thal settings as well as sickle, 
And when can some of the uh, process improvement uh, changes, like, uh, when can we expect them to be incorporated? Yeah, there's a lot to cover there in the five minutes I'm seeing right here. But um, talk quickly, please. Talk quickly. <laughs> So, so we did have an interesting year with our lentiglobin program, and it's interesting to see that, that value curve that was put up in the, in the last presentation because I think lentiglobin is a microcosm of that where you've got this great early data in uh, transfusion-dependent beta thalassemia early on, and then uh, the reality of drug development comes through. And, and frankly, we, we, we expected that there were going to be some interesting learnings as we go through the process of getting more and more patients on board. We've talked historically about patient-to-patient -patient variability. That's the nature of gene therapy uh, broadly, that you're going to have that. Um, some of the great things that came out of those learnings is that there is a genotype. Genotype matters in this population. And very simply, there are certain genotypes, the beta-0, beta-0 genotype, the 0, 0 is there for a reason, they don't have the ability to produce functioning globin. So they have a much higher hurdle in terms of uh, how the gene therapy product can have an effect. They just don't produce any functioning globin, and therefore, whatever you're bringing in exogenously has to make up that, that difference. Whereas the non-beta-0 population, they have some functioning globin, and therefore, your differential to get them above what is clinically acceptable around 9 grams per deciliter of functioning globin is, is lower. And in that population, we were able to show, at least across the, the patients that we disclosed at ASH, that every one of the non-beta-0, beta-0 population uh, were, became transfusion independent after six months. And, and now, some of the data are out uh, close to two years with very consistent expression of, of the gene and uh, transfusion independence. So for that population, tremendous news, and we're moving aggressively forward with that population um, in, in our clinical studies. With the non-beta-0, beta-0 population, we showed clinical benefit, and not insignificant clinical benefit, in that we were able to reduce the number of transfusions, anywhere from 33 to 100 percent across those patients, um, but we didn't reach transfusion independence. We need to see that data play out. It's still early data. It's still early numbers. So the intent is to let that play out throughout 2016 and really get a better read on whether or not there's a, a regulatory path forward with that, that data, with transfusion reduction. And then we also have, as you referenced, some, we call them VCN additives, which is basically when you take the viral vector that has the gene sequence uh, in it uh, of interest and you mix that with the cells that are collected from the patient. Um, in this case, we're talking about hematopoietic stem cells. Uh, by adding certain um, uh, additives, into that mix, you can make those cells, the hematopoietic stem cells, more receptive to the insertion of the gene sequence. And we've been doing this now for three, four years, and it just so happens that this year we had a bit of a breakthrough from a preclinical standpoint that gives us great hope that we can increase the potency of our viral vectors and the receptivity of those cells so that you can get more potent cells going into the, the patient and then ultimately, hopefully, producing more globin to be able to serve a much broader swath of patients, which also may affect sickle cell as well. And we're applying that uh, as aggressively as we can with, uh, with the sickle cell. Can you elaborate a little bit when you say as aggressively as you can? When might that actually be incorporated into, into clin the clinical path and what are the gating steps there? Sure. So um, we're excited about the preclinical data that has emerged. We've now done it uh, not only on small scale but large scale and confirmed that, um, that, that it's having the effect that we want. Um, the intent now is to get that in the clinic in um, ongoing trials, in particular the 207 trial um, that, that we are embarking upon, and which is a beta thalassemia trial. Uh, our belief, but it's subject to regulatory interactions, and we're having those as we speak um, on a continuous basis, are, we hope to be able to have that implemented clinically under the existing IND by the end of the year. But obviously, I have to caveat that, that it is dependent on uh, ongoing discussions with regulatory authorities. We see it as, an, as a change to the manufacturing as opposed to a new product. And so far, that's been consistent with our dialogue. We've got just half a minute. Um, and I have to ask you about the uh, anti-BCMA CAR-T program. And, and wh where is the excitement uh, around that target uh, coming from? So this is the first CAR-T program that we have uh, entered the clinic now with. 
Um, it's targeting BCMA. And there were some data at ASH, uh, late breaking news from the NIH, uh, that gave, I guess, a real hope and belief that BCMA could be a very good target for multiple myeloma in that there was a, a complete response in uh, relapsed refractory patients um, and a partial response as well. So it, it gave the, the, the proof of concept that targeting BCMA with a CAR-T product can have a clinical effect and, and a fairly dramatic one if you look at the, uh, at the data. We have what we believe to be the next generation. That was a gamma retro product. We have a Lenti product that was using uh, uh, a different uh, co-stimulatory domain, ours is 41BB, which we think has an advantage in terms of persistence of T cells. And that's been shown in the CD19 world uh, to be the case. So we're pretty excited about the construct and taking that next generation product forward and generating clinical data. Right. Well, unfortunately, I think we're out of time, but uh, Jeff, thanks so much for, for joining us and sharing the Bluebird story.